Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome all of you to this new course uh, which we have designed and the title of this course is Democratic Processes and Social Movements in India. As you can see from the title itself, the paper will have only two components. The first part of the paper uh, which I will be covering will deal with the idea of democratic institutions, democratic processes in India, while the other part of the paper will basically focus on the different social movements which are going on in India for last so many decades. The idea is to understand that how in the modern times, post-independent India has evolved its own democratic framework, its democratic institutions. And along with that, we will also see that how people have integrated with and interacted with those institutions and evolved their own mechanism of bargaining with the democratic institutions in India. As I have said, the paper will have two components. So I will start with the first component of the paper that is democratic processes in India. To start with, let me make it very clear to you that we will try to focus basically on the main political institutions and framework which are working in India at the moment, how those institutions have evolved over a period of time, how those concepts which we otherwise take for granted like democracy, parliament, party system, social movements, how these gender, caste, class, all these concepts, how they have evolved in the Indian context and integrated with the Indian institutions, more so with democratic politics like parliament. To begin with, let's see that how Indian democracy in the past, present and in the future context has evolved over a period of time. As we all know that India is an ancient civilization. Indian civilization goes back to the Vedic times and even pre-Vedic times. We are also well aware of the fact that in the his particular historical context, there were few institutions which evolved in India and they gave us the glimpses of republic in the Indian context. And as was during the ancient times that we find that people evolved their own institutions which were basically focusing on making people part of the process of governance. It was during that time only that we also find that how through the process of Sabhaj, Samitis, etc., that the idea of governance reached its zenith. And as we see today, that some of those concepts were also later on borrowed by the Constituent Assembly and it became the part of what we call as the Indian constitution. The bedrock of Indian democracy since ancient time is also based on some of the ideas which were propagated by the texts like Ramayana, Mahabharat, Buddhist text, as well as the Jain philosophy. Not only this, the five schools of philosophy were also significant in terms of contributing and shaping the contours of Indian democracy at that point of time. India as a continuing civilization moved on in terms of its society, its practices, its culture, as well as its languages. But some of the reminiscences, some of the practices, some of the ideas of those times continued to live with people. And it was carried forward not only in the medieval times, but to the modern times too. It was in this process only that in the medieval times we find that we have traditions of bhakti in the form of Kavi, Tulsidas, Nanak, Gorakhna, and many others in the South too. They all contributed in their own ways in terms of making people part of the whole civilization which we call as India. And it was their contribution only which gave shape to India as we know it today. During the freedom struggle, India's journey to the road of freedom was full of challenges. And we all are aware of the fact that illiteracy, caste, sati, 
economic plunder by the Britishers, poverty, all those were some of the major issues. When the Britishers came to India, India was already struggling in terms of no one center of power which was in control of the whole geography of India. Many kings and many local zamindars were controlling the different parts of India. It was in taking advantage of this kind of situations that Britishers controlled India and eventually it happened so that the problem of illiteracy, poverty, backwardness, economic uh, disintegrations as well as some other social socio-political problems significantly contributed in weakening the democratic ethos of India in whatever rudimentary form it was available to us. And it was not only that, by the late 19th century, a new light dawned on India and its struggle for freedom took the final shape in the form of Gandhi, Nehru, Patel, Ambedkar, Bose, and thousands and millions of others who took part in ensuring that India achieved freedom from the clutches of British Empire. Now here we need to be little careful in terms of understanding that how India, while integrating its own cultural ethos, while it is in dialogue with its own civilizational past from the ancient and the medieval time, that we find that India is also coming out with new ideas and new understanding. While India is interacting with the British Empire, India is open to the modern ideas and to modernity. We will see in this paper that how those ideas eventually gave sub substantial shape to India's democratic ethos and democratic processes as well as it also gave shape to India's civilization and making it as a modern one. This particular lecture which we are, are dealing with today will give you an overview of overall democratic processes in India as it has unfolded in terms of different decades. So as you will see in the later part of the lecture that I will go by decade wise to figure out that how India evolved its own concepts and categories to give shape to democratic ethos in India. So as I was uh, talking about that India while in interacting with the British Empire came out with this uh, new ideas of uh, mo modern education, came out with new ideas of gender justice, came out with new ideas of eradicating the problem of caste system in India, as well as also came out with the creative expressions about the economic upliftment of people. And in this context, we see that people like uh, Nehru, Sadar Patel, Gandhi, and many others contributed significantly. Ambedkar had his very important role in terms of eradicating the problem of caste. The constitution of India eventually in 1947 came out as the ultimate solution to many of the problems which India was grappling for many decades and centuries, more so after the coming of the Britishers. If, we, if you carefully read Indian constitution, you will find that it provides not only the political solutions to India's problems, but also socio-economic as well as cultural. Indian constitution is a comprehensive document which deals with each and every aspects of human, human life within India. As we see that Indian constitution also reflects the different contesting ideas which were very vibrant during the India's freedom struggle. Coming to the idea of democracy and democratic processes. Democracy, as we all know, is something to do with politics and thus democratic processes straightway come out of it. And there are definitely, there are interlinkages between politics, democracy and democratic processes. So we need to be very attentive about figuring out that how these three different terms are interlinked and how can we make sense of them. To start with, how to define politics? Politics is in one way, politics is about contestation for power. But is it all about contestation for power? It goes beyond that. In the Indian intellectual tradition, 
politics is also about giving shape to your dreams. It's also about making a new future. Politics is also about distribution of resources. In that context, then the question comes that what are those resources? How are we going to decide that which resources needs to be distributed? Who are going to be the right claimant of those resources? And what will be the basis of distribution of those resources? These are some of the parameters which we use in politics to figure out that how these three things comes into as one integrated whole. Similarly, democracy as part of politics is considered as one of the best available solutions to some of the problems which I dealt with or talked about while discussing what is politics. That is, how are we going to distribute the resources? How are we going to decide which resources needs to be distributed? And who are the right claimants? Democracy provides us the right platform on which these kind of questions needs to be raised, on which these kinds of questions needs to be grappled with and the solutions can be figured out. In the plain terms, democracy is about people's participation in the political processes. If the direct participation is taking place, we may safely call it as the example of direct democracy. So voting is a part of direct democracy in the sense that people go out and directly vote. Similarly, when government runs on behalf of people, then we can see that it is a practice of indirect democracy where the people's mandate through voting takes a form of government formation and thus through that prime ministers and other ministers work on behalf of the people. So democracy here you can see has the institutional form too in the form of parliament, in the form of president, in the form of judiciary and etc. The different pillars of democracy works together in order to ensure that people's participation must take some kind of constructive creative form. Coming to the democratic processes, now this is very important that one can easily talk about and define what is idea of politics and what is democracy. But when it comes to democratic processes, then we need to be more careful about making sense of what are the democratic processes. In one sense, democratic processes are about how the different institutions are working within a democratic setup. That is, how the Indian constitution is performing, how the Indian parliament is giving voice to the people, people's uh, anxiety, people's anger, or people's concern, or their questions. Similarly, how judiciary is functioning, how other institutions, other forms of government in India or across the world are giving shape to people's imagination that could be one part of what we call as democratic processes. But there is other part of this whole exercise too. And that is that how people are interacting with the government, what are the different mechanisms through which they precise the government, through which they, they, the people bargain with the government or in what manner people figure out that what are their problems and how best they can channelize their problem in the form of vote or in terms of precising government or bargaining with them. So, for instance, caste movement or gender movements, women's movement or movements against uh, environmental crisis. These are some of the processes, democratic processes through which people willingly come out and discuss their issues, they give vent to their anxieties, their problems, their angers or their issues and they make it sure that the government of that time take cognizance of those issues and also finally decides how to best to go about it. And thus all three are closely interlinked to each other that is politics, democracy and democratic processes. Democratic processes is very much part of, integrated part of the whole idea of politics as well as idea of democracy. Both politics, first politics will not be able to survive for long without democracy and more so democracy will not function well if the democratic processes are not taking shape. So uh, as I said in defining the process of politics that who gets what, when and how is idea of politics. Similarly democracy and democratic processes leads to democratization of the society. We can safely call here 
that the integrative process between politics, democracy, and democratic processes finally ends up into the result of what we call as the democratization of society. And what does this mean? The process of democratization of society? That precisely means that the distribution of resources in the society. And here when I am repeatedly using this term resources, the resources are not strictly in terms of economic resources, but also in terms of political resources like rights, liberty, justice, idea of equality, or social uh, resources like caste, class, etc. That how politics distributes these resources, how well people are getting aware of their rights, their liberty, their justice, idea of equality, or the whole idea of equal moral worth of all individuals in the society. If people are conscious about their positions in the society, if people think that they can fight for their rights and they feel safe in the democracy, then we can safely say that democracy has achieved its target of democratizing the society. So we will see that how India in the post-independent last 75 years has evolved over a period of time to ensure that its people feel secure within the country and they have the realization of their political, social, as well as economic resources. In the pre-independence time, we see that India was struggling for self-rule. Interestingly, if you look into the whole history of India's freedom struggle, you will find that the first half of India's freedom struggle for almost 150 years, the whole fight was only to ensure that we uh, have some kind of uh, um, uh, some kind of understanding or some kind of uh, uh, respectable position within the British Empire. It is only after the uh, coming of Gandhi and certain changes which took place across the world as well as in India that eventually Congress and all other leaders who were fighting for India's due respect and due position within British Empire realized that India needs to now pull up its song and fight for India's freedom. More so, as you know and aware of the history, that it was the Jalia Ola Bagh massacre after which that India was India's conscience was shaken to the core and Gandhi and other Congress leaders eventually came together to go for a complete uh, independence. And in, in 1928, the idea of Purna Swaraj was passed within the Congress. Till then, this idea of self-rule was discussed and eventually that transformed into the idea of Swadhinta, that is freedom from any kind of external rule. But external rule was one part of the whole fight for India's freedom struggle. Eventually, under Gandhi's guidance, the fight then start, started for Swaraj. Now here Swaraj has two meanings. Swaraj here in one sense is about self-rule. That is, that we will rule for our own self. The other meaning of Swaraj is that rule over oneself. And this is the second meaning of Swaraj, which became very important in the later half of India's freedom. The Indians are not only now supposed to, under the guidance of Gandhi, not only supposed to fight for their self-rule or freedom from the external rule, but also that they want to have a dignified life, a life which will have control in their own hand. And thus, the process of democratization and democratic processes began well before India's independence in the form of Swaraj. Similarly, Ambedkar's idea of political democracy as limited concept and his understanding, as we see in the Constituent Assembly debate, that Ambedkar very clearly underlined that what we are going to achieve on 15th August 1947 is political freedom, but we need to be aware of that the constant fight for and the struggle for equality, liberty and justice will only give us the idea of social democracy and thus it is a social democracy which should be the target for 
India's freedom struggle. Eventually, rule of law and justice became the cardinal principle of India's constant, uh, constitution. And we see that how India, through its politics during the freedom struggle and democratic fight, that laid the path for democratic processes and democratization of Indian society. If we carefully look into the whole constituent assembly debate, we find that there were certain things which were deeply discussed in the society in the constituent assembly debate. And some of the results, some of the solutions which were formed were very interesting. To begin with, the nature of Indian polity was discussed in detail, in the sense that whether the India is going to be republic or not, that is, whether the constitution will be framed in, in terms of people's will or will it be something other than that? Whether we will have presidential form or the parliamentary form, whether we will have one party, two party system or multi-party system, all those issues were discussed in detail. Along with that, various concepts like fundamental rights, representation of communities in terms of caste and religion, their voting and in one go it was decided that all of us will get universal suffrage that is there will be no check in terms of who will have more value of their votes all individuals who will be above a certain age and those who are adult got the right to vote across caste class and gender similarly the issue of federalism and the idea of regional aspiration was also discussed and it was ensured that through federalist structure the regional aspiration will be taken care of. Similarly, women representation and gender justice was also discussed in detail during the constituent assembly debate. If one need to understand in detail about India's journey of democracy in the last 75 years, the good starting point could be the constituent assembly debates because in thousands and thousands of pages, those debates which went on for more than a year, India finally concluded and decided that it will go for a parliamentary form of democracy in a multi-party system and so certain fundamental rights are going to be the safeguard for ensuring that people get their due in the process of democratization. The constant assembly debate also reflects certain contestation of ideas within them. So as we know that more than 300 people, uh, 300 representatives across from India were discussing under one roof to talk about and look for the future of India in the constituent assembly. But one need to be uh, very uh, clear here that those were not one voices. There were diverse voices and thus you can see that the Indian constitution reflects those voices and reflects those contestations which and those contestations were by the way part of india's freedom struggle for very long and thus they were very those were very evolved mature ideas with different political leaders who are discussing in the constituent assembly debate thus we can see that liberal framework of the early congress moderate and extremist the whole idea of purna swaraj the gandhian idea of swaraj Hindu nationalist discourse in the form of Samarkar, Hindu Mahasabha and RSS, Islamic nationalist discourse of Iqbal and Jinnah, similarly Ambedkar's idea of social democracy, all these ideas were contesting with each other. Similarly, uh, the communist, the left parties were also part of the process and the constituent assembly was in that way all representative of diverse sections of the society diverse opinion of the society and eventually it gave birth to certain kind of consensus by 1947 and Indian constitution came out. The preamble of the Indian constitution is the most perfect representation of the consensus which were built in the constant assembly debate that what are going to be the bedrocks of Indian democracy and as the line shows that we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into sovereign secular democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice and look and this whole term 
the justice is qualified by social economic and political similarly liberty of thought expressions belief faith and worship in addition the idea of equality of status and of opportunity and to promote among them all the idea of fraternity thus as you can see i didn't underline here the word socialist because this was added later in 1970s uh, these terms and these ideas they were very much discussed in detail in the constituent assembly and the preamble reflected the whole ethos of the indian constitution in terms of its commitment to democratic processes while talking about these creative expressions of india's contestation for democracy and certain principles which were laid down in the freedom struggle and through that it got reflection in the indian constitution we also need to be little careful here and underline the problems which india was facing at the time of independence because that underlining will give us cert certain sense and understanding that how some of those problems and challenges continued in india in last 75 years and constantly questioned the whole democratic processes and in return the democratic institutions india have evolved and responded to those challenges in different decades in their own ways and has strengthened the democracy in india over a period of time so some of the challenges at the time of independence were to start with of course the partition the coming of india and pakistan in 1947 and due to that the communal violence which gripped india uh, more so in north india uh, shaped and influenced the democratic processes in india for a very long time poverty integration of princely states regional disparities and underdevelopment rural economy lack of industrialization we all know that only a few centers of industrial developments uh, were there and india was more of a satellite country which provided raw material to the western countries till 1947 thus as you can see from some of these problems which i have underlined including poverty partition regional disparities rural economy that india was primarily despite the fact that it won the political freedom but still it had to cover a very long distance in terms of ensuring that india is going to be a truly democratic country because unless people are not going to get jobs unless people are not going to get their due respect in terms of social hierarchies they are not going to maintain peace and tranquility within the national boundaries and at the national boundaries in terms of its relationship with pakistan or china india will continue to struggle and it was in this context that India started its journey in 1947, despite all these challenges. Thus, we will see in the first phase, in the very first decade of 1950s, the democratic processes in India started unfolding. That was the 1950s was the phase of a whole lot of uh, big dreams, uh, aspirations. There was a unique kind of enthusiasm of a youth country, a young country, which has just taken, just got the independence and Nehruvian vision of making India a, a world power, a democratic country was always there. Nehru was very much enchanted by the USSR model of economic development, but at the same time, he was also aware of its limit. And it was in that context that India decided to go for the mixed economy that is the planning uh, where the planning will be central to development in the sense that some of the big industries, the uh, heavy industries are going to be controlled by the state and other things will be open for the market. It will be a kind of a capitalist economy guided by socialist principles. As we will see in the later part of this lecture, that this whole idea of capitalist economy working within the broad guidelines of socialist principles that became the huge problem for India's developmental discourse in terms of its economy as well as societal developments. Modernization as it was achieved in the West became the reference point for India in terms of achieving 
new standards of development and modernization became the new trope and this idea was as we as i have said was imported from the west and became the crucial reference point for india in terms of its uh, uh, future making of the future and fulfilling its dream and the promises which was made in the indian constitution and thus modern industries large dams they were became the new temples of modern india this uh, last sentence which i just uh, referred to that is the modern industries and big dams as the modern temples of uh, india that was uh, referred by uh, nehru himself that these uh, big industries and these modern uh, frameworks of economic development like them they are going to fulfill and provide india certain kind of confidence in its agriculture sector as well as in its industrial sector the ultimate goal was of nehruvian uh, economic planning and development was to eradicate poverty as soon as possible because at that point of time around more than 80% of people were living under the poverty and there was serious crisis of food as well as joblessness by the time 1950s got over and 60s started new kind of crises started emerging within the indian democracy and indian politics those crises were reflections not only of bad planning in 1950s and the limits of india's developmental project but also due to certain kinds of political instabilities as well as economic problems the reflection of those uh, emerging crises in 1960s had its uh, first reflection in terms of shattering of nehruvian consensus that is that all the political establishments all the political voices or political parties are coming together on the common platform to fight for india's upliftment in terms of poverty and development it it was for the first time that opposition parties started questioning the whole project of modernity and modernization in india um, in the context of uh, nehru's um, idea of certain kind of dream about uh, india's role in the world politics and relation with pakistan and china also got a big jolt when in 1962 china attacked india and similarly in 1965 india again faced the problem and the western front when pakistan was there and thus we see that the whole the the glorious uh, promises which were made in the 1950s and which were at one point of time were the driving force for the young democracy like india were now slowly and gradually turning into nightmares the there in that context that nationalization of bank was uh, decided by indira gandhi government before that the plan holiday took place from uh, 1966 to 1969 because planning was again now not working there was serious food crisis across india india was not dependent on america and many other western countries in terms of importing wheat congress lost elections in various states in 1967 uh, assembly elections congress lost more than nine states uh, in north india and uh, some of the uh, south indian states too not only this india was also started facing certain internal problems in terms of security that in west bengal in the remote areas of uh, darjeeling there is this village called naxalbari there ideologically um, oriented certain sections of uh, people revolted against the uh, tea planters uh, those who were controlling the tea plantations and gradually that movement of the laborers who were working in that tea plantation in that particular village naxalbari turned up into kind of a movement across not only west bengal but various part of north india as well as in south and it spread like wildfire where the left oriented uh, youths and uh, certain activists they became part of this whole um, uh, agenda of uh, attacking the government through violent means and uh, asking for their uh, due justice in the society rajni kothari a famous social scientist in his book politics in india argues that 
the phase of late 1960s was the first democratic upsurge in India in the sense that other than the Congress party, various other political uh, parties, political voices started emerging in India and thus democracy in India got a new shape, a new form and a new voice. It is true that some of those voices were violent, some of those voices were against the state, but also true is the fact that some of those voices which stood against the Congress finally gave shape to certain voices in terms of caste and gender in the uh, politics in North India. One of the silver lining of 1960s amidst all these challenges was Green Revolution, which uh, not only ensure that India is now self-sufficient and self-dependent in terms of food production, but it also contributed significantly in terms of rural economy and gave new ray of hope for lots and lots of people who were otherwise dependent on their farmlands, but they were not getting the due return of their labor. And it was in this context that a new class emerged in the rural India during 1960s and that new particular new class eventually most of them were part of uh, other backward uh, classes as we know them as uh, OBCs today that they significantly contributed in the Indian political arena 1970s onwards. Similarly because of the rise of this OBC class and OBC politics that a new form of farmers politics also emerged in India in late 1960s and 1970s and it shaped the Indian politics forever. In the following lectures, we will see when while talking about farmers movement in India that how Green Revolution gave birth to a new class of uh, politicians and new class of farmers uh, in India who shaped and contributed India's politics. 1970s dealt with a more deeper crisis. In, it started with Bangladesh war in 1971. It was in this context that Indira Gandhi came out with this idea of a new slogan of Garibi Hatao. So a new form of politics started taking shape which was based on more populist measures and giving populist slogans to attract people, to attract voters for elections and for forming the governments. Against this, populist measures and rising prices of uh, commodities against growing corruptions in the government that JP, Jepa Narayan came out with this uh, new movement against poverty, corruption, unemployment, student politics took new shape and it came together, came uh, uh, out in resonance with left movement in Bengal, Bihar and in the south. The, there was a new pressure now started building up on Indira Gandhi government in early 1970s, 1973-74 and in this context that she uh, responded this crisis situation by imposing emergency on India and it was declared on 25th of June 1975 and some of the civil liberties were curtailed. Thousands of people including the leader of opposition party were arrested. We can safely say that this phase of 1975 to 77 for the two years when the emergency was imposed on India that it was the black period of India's political history in modern times. It was during that period when the crisis mounted to that an extent that a particular political leader and the party and the government responded in the form of em imposing emergency on India. Thus we can also see as to that within 25 years of India's freedom that new kinds of challenges, new kinds of crises started emerging. So of course on the one hand we had the democratic upsurge in 1960s in terms of more people participating in the formation of the government. Other uh, various castes, various groups are now giving voice to the problems of their time but also true is the fact that the democratic institutions are uh, in India including the parliament was under stress and the autonomy, the freedom, the power of people was not in resonance with some of the democratic institutions 
including parliament at that point of time. And the end result of this unfortunate situation was in the form of emergency. But it was because of the resilience of the Indian democracy and the deep democratic roots that within two years, India went back to its basic, that is the removal of emergency took place and Congress was defeated in the 1977 general election and a new government was formed, which was under the uh, leadership of uh, Prime Minister Moraji. And it was during this time that we see that how different opposition parties came together on the name of defending democracy in India. That government continued for not more than uh, two and a half years. And again, in 1980s, the general election took place and Congress came back and won the election. Indira Gandhi again became the prime minister. Thus you can see, and there where we can underline again the, uh, the whole strength of and the creative potential of Indian democracy in the sense that when a particular political party or a political leader is not perform performing up to mark, the, par the people are ready to punish. But the moment they realize that instability in terms of political system in India is not working in their favor, that again they go back to the same person and the same political party, but ensuring that this time nothing of that sort can take place. Thus, the 1980s started with this good note of uh, Indira Gandhi again coming back to power and forming the government. But soon there were new challenges started emerging. The first challenge emerged was in the form of regional aspirations. New kinds of movement started emerging in the Northeast, more so in Assam. Similarly, in Punjab, a new kind of crisis started emerging. The separatists started giving voice to creation of a separate country out of Punjab. As we see that the new frontiers of challenges for democratic processes in India started taking shape and the secessionist movements in the Northeast are, is one example of that. Punjab crisis took form, uh, led to demand for Khalistan. And eventually, unfortunately, it led to assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1983. And thus, now India was again deep into crisis in terms of functioning of its democratic institutions as well as the democratization of the society. On the other hand, the economic growth was already sluggish and people were uh, under leading, undergoing certain kind of stress because of unemployment and the uh, price rises. Across the globe, things were also changing fast. Reagan in the USA and Thatcher in the UK, they respectively became the president and prime minister in their own countries. And, and that's how the ushering of a new economic process began across the world. That is what we call as the opening up of economy across the world. And later in the another lecture, we will see uh, as the process of globalization started taking shape under the leadership of Thatcher and Reagan. In the Indian context, because of this instability in the political processes, assassination of the prime minister, a new prime minister in the form of Rajiv Gandhi coming into picture, that things were not going the way it was desirable. Identity politics, caste politics, women's movement, all of this started taking a new form, a more agitated form across India. Interestingly, it was during this time only that environmental issues were now became the central focus of Indian politics in many ways. Of course, part of it was there in 1970s also in the process of Chipko Andolan and other, but Bhopal gas tragedy and water crisis in certain regions in India brought back the focus on environmental issues again. And this time, people were more aware about these issues and the contestations were also going on. Violent Naxal movement, despite the fact that it was spreading across India, that by late 1980s, rise of new political parties and leadership emerged. And it was in this context only that the Congress dominance was again challenged within a decade. And 
a new political outfit in the form of Bharatiya Janata Party or BJP emerged in 1989. And for the first time, second non-Congress government was formed under the leadership of uh, VP Singh first and later under Chandrasekhar. 1990s then ushered a new era. A serious economic crisis was there at the doorstep along with internal disturbances in Kashmir and Punjab continued. Amidst all this, liberalization, privatization and globalization was wholeheartedly accepted and the Indian economy was opened for the first time for the world economy and that's how the process of globalization in India began. But despite all this, issue of corruption, terrorism, regional disparities to continue. One interesting uh, development in terms of democratic institutions and the formation of new democratic institution was introduction of Panchayati Raj through 73rd and 74th amendment in the Indian constitution that for the first time decentralization of political power took place in India. Now, other than the two layers of federal structure in India that is the central and the state, we had the third structure that is the Panchayati Raj at the Gram Sabha level and in the ward levels in the municipalities in the cities. This was, if this was one development in terms of uh, institutional progress or democratization of the institutional framework. On the other hand, in the political system, new era of coalition government also ushered and various non-Congress -go government were formed in 1990s under the leadership of Indrakam Argojal or Deve Gora or later on under the leadership of Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Nuclear test and intensified disinvestment were two very important crucial incidents which took place in the late 1990s and which shaped the Indian uh, uh, foreign policy as well as India's position vis-a-vis -vis its economic development. Caste politics took deep roots in the states like Bihar and UP and it threw a new set of leaders in the form of Lalu Prasad, Mulayam, Kansiram, Mayati and others and they significantly contributed in not only democratization of politics in India but they also contributed significantly in terms of giving shape to the aspirations of various people. Women's movement also got new voices in the forms of LGBT. The new slogan in this context was that personal is political and now women were not ready to settle with this much only that they are fighting for dowry or they are fighting for education. Now they were fighting for more personal rights, more freedom and more equality. Dalit pol politics uh, strengthened its roots during this time and it was again that the central imagination of North Indian politics started centering around the re-emergence of Ambedkar in North Indian politics. In the decade of 2000s and 2010s, globalization impacted the politics as well as the social and economic aspects at the micro level. The impact of globalization reached to the rural India and because of this, the new middle class emerged in Indian context and market and mandal politics had deep impact on the electoral politics. Thus, as you can see, the combination of middle class, market economy and mandal politics. They readjusted with each other and impacted the electoral politics in India. It was in this context that surprisingly in 2004, the India government lost its mandate and Congress returned to power and continued for two terms. Although this return was in the form of coalition government and just then the Congress was the uh, largest party but certainly it was far away from the single majority. During, his, during this UPA government phase, Manrega, tribal rights, right to education were some of the provisions made by the government in terms of strengthening the democratic processes in India and ensuring that people's aspirations take a new shape under the uh, pressure of globalization. It is in this context also that the churning of uh, on the ground took form and because of this, 
multinational companies, social media, new language of politics started emerging. The youth of this generation now started looking beyond the government jobs in terms of going out of their hometowns, looking for better opportunities in uh, cities like Bangalore, Noida, Hyderabad, etc. That a new formation, new formation of cultural practices, new formation of political social practices started emerging and it contributed significantly in the economic growth too. We find that this course of rights once again took the center stage of politics in India and new social movements started emerging. So you find that some of the social movements against uh, land acquisition, some of the movements against water crisis, environmental issues also taking shape in India. So in one sense, of course, the economic growth and economic rise because of globalization contributed significantly in terms of GDP, in terms of uh, emergence of a new middle class, in terms of urbanization of the Indian society. But on the other hand, it also threw new challenges and thus people responded very creatively, very positively to those challenges in the form of new social movements, environmental issues, climate change, corruption, caste, national movements, all those also started taking new shape along with tribal issues. It was in this backdrop of all these developments and the, how the state, the government and the different political parties are negotiating both at the central as well as at the regional levels in different states that BJP emerged as the single largest party as well as had its own majority in 2014 election and Modi formed the government and thus a new chapter began in the Indian politics. UP2 government was marred with a whole lot of issues of corruption and it was in the backdrop of this that Anna movement took place and a new political outfit also emerged in the form of Aam Admi Party. New institutional arrangements under the leadership of uh, BJP government took place and planning commission was replaced by Niti Ayo with uh, altogether a new push for economic development. Regional politics also took a new, entered into a new phase where many regional political parties lost elections and new dominance of single party of BJP started taking shape. It's, it was almost like the way Congress was winning in 1950s across um, different states of India that BJP also had achieved that kind of dominance in various states. State boundaries were altered and the Telangana as a new state emerged during that phase. Similarly, Article 370 was removed and the new union territories in the form of Jambu, Kashmir and Ladda were also uh, uh, given birth to during this uh, phase in government. Now it is in this context, as we saw that whole lot of developments took place um, in the last 75 years of India's independence, yet certain questions comes into um, in our mind regarding the future of democracy and democratic processes in India. Here we need to be uh, uh, careful in terms of making sense of uh, how to uh, understand the democratic processes. The decline of Congress regarded by many as a crucial component of democratic stability in the country. So if you look into some of the writings which are available on political uh, processes and democratic process in India, we find that there are two kinds of readings broadly. One which will argue that it was because of the dominant positions of Congress in the 1950s and 60s that India had its stability and India could manage to achieve certain uh, things in, um, in terms of economic growth as well as institutional frameworks. But on the other hand, there are others who will argue that it is because of the collapse of Congress system in 1960s and its defeat only that the process of democratization got strengthened in India and different political parties, different voices emerged and they were in their position to contest with the state and form a new kind of India which was more inclusive. Unstable coalitions and frequent elections in 1990s also needs to be analyzed as to whether they were part of 
the democratization of the country or whether they were weakening the Indian political uh, processes and system because so many frequent elections always contributes to a whole lot of economic stress. Similarly, slow economic growth at various stages, averaging less than 1% per annum in real per capita terms have gone together with mobilization of diverse groups seeking to gain particularistic benefit for themselves. So, you will find that in the writings of Barras, Rudolf and Rudolf, the argument goes that the economic development was, is cornered by only a few classes in the society and rest are still struggling. In that context, as we saw that in different decades, so many crises took place in India, then the question comes that why democracy and democratic process survived in India. We can safely say that out of the different reasons, building of the strong reformist parties, as Kohli argues, recognizing and upholding the roles played by local leaders and decentralizing power to village panchayats in 1990s are some of the important reasons as to why India survived for so long and its democracy is still continue to flourish. The last question one need to raise here is that what is to be done for the future of India and India's democracy? Here it needs to be underlined very importantly that we need to reinforce the faith in democratic processes, people's involvement needs to be ensured, and the health of democracy can only be ensured by that. Wider participation will always entrench democracy by reducing the appeal of alternative violent non-democratic options. Similarly, prospects for stability become enhanced as increasing number of individuals and groups into democratic system will become the part of the process. In the context of India, Sabarwal claims that while procedural democracy is fairly well established, including a constitution, a differentiated party structure, and a periodic acts of choice between parties by an electorate for election to legislature, the practice of democracy needs to be strengthened further. These are some of the following references uh, which you can consult. Other than these three references, I will provide you a long list of references for this whole course. And with this, I will end this lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. 
they are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.